and uh, oh, I've had all kinds of manner of technical grief. I think I figured it out. So I'm just happy to relax and talk about some chess. Um, it's been a pretty interesting week with Isle of Man, and I was, I want to say I was skeptical of these tournaments, both the Fide Swiss thing and then the Isle of Man thing. They both seemed kind of similar. It felt a little janky. And in the end, maybe it produced like some champions that are going to play in the tournament to decide who qualifies uh, that maybe wouldn't be your first thought. Um, but that said, I thought the event itself was a beautiful thing. Um, so uh, here at the club in St. Louis, I talked about um, Fabi's win against Giaro from Spain. And that was also with an English, and I thought it was an amazing victory. Um, in an in interview at the end of the tournament, Fabi mentioned this game against fellow American Samuel Sevian as the game that he felt was the, the best played. And, yeah, I want to take a look at it. At, I watched it at the time, and I really didn't get it. Hi, DZ. Good to see you, buddy. Um... I didn't get it at the time. And so there are still things about this that I don't get. So I want to just talk about it a little bit. Oh, God, Max. I've had computer grief <laughs> over today, but I've figured it out mostly. All right. I can't, fi I can't, I don't think I'm going to be able to write in anything in the chat box, but that's okay. I will just talk to whoever talks to me over there. Okay. So here we go, e5, and this, I'm going to say, is mostly well-known stuff, um, been played forever. The, um, let's call it the more traditional move here is knight c3, which white could transpose to in the game as well. But let's look at what he does. It's the first kind of interesting move, and... Um, I want to say, at first, I felt like this move was uh, testing the limits because both on this move and then the next, <laughs> it seemed to me like black had a chance to play something like e4, knight e1, and h5, where I've seen similar situations recently with Harry the h-pawn and they become very frightening. In this case, though, it seems like, it seems like anyway, that white lives after something like knight c3, h4, and then snip on e4 with the bishop, creating some kind of tension. Um, let me just mention my own personal drama. For years, I've l enjoyed playing this particular position for white, but the problem has been that right here that it's been known d3 has always been known i think that it's not much after check because it's kind of an annoying check and there's no great place to the piece and he's going to play a5 so you know what you'd like to do is play castles and then in a thing that's mildly similar to what we get here black can do this and this turns out to be perhaps playable for white, but very dangerous. And, you know, obviously it's a thing where you'd want to calculate it out, and I'm sure Fabi turned on the computer here before uh, he tried this move order. But maybe as a general rule of thumb, we can say the reason it's going to work here and not in the game situation is that in the game... The, the, the game is more, in, in the game we're going to cover today with Fabi, is more open than this game. Whereas here, the d4 pawn is getting, giving black some nice uh, spatial advantage and keeping the position close enough for the h4 break to do its business before black gets blown open in the center. Okay, so here we go. Castles. Knight b6. Loads of different moves here for black. You could play knight f6 and all kinds of different stuff. But knight b6 is definitely the traditional move. Um, you know, back in the day, people would play something like uh, bishop e, 
well, you can't be, you gotta be careful. On bishop e7, you gotta worry about d4. So knight b6 is designed to deal with that, amongst other things. Uh, the other thing it's dealing with is just getting out of the pressure with the bishop. Now, this might be a good point to, to note that black's strategic problem for the next uh, several moves is uh, the b6 knight. All right. And that gives some uh, help to understanding white's provocative next move, b3. And like with um, the previous situation where black could play e4, I also felt that some kind of violence with e4 was dangerous here, something like this. Um, but I couldn't really make anything work, and there was this cute variation which went queen c2, bishop f5, smack, and then bishop c6, kind of surprising. And the point being that if our queen gets this bishop, the queen uh, will prove to, amongst other things, just be a good defender of the black king. So this seems like an advantage for white. Um, of course, black could try something weird like that. But we are busting open the center. And, it, you know, although it's very complicated, in comparison to the other position I looked at before, right, white will really have the chance to explode the white center, and, and that's will give white the opportunity to fulfill the old dogma, which is an attack on the wing with h5 is met with an attack in the center. Okay, bishop e7, bishop b2, f6, and this position has been seen a couple times recently uh, in GM play, and you know, let's just recap it. For much of the 80s and 90s, uh, this position here was knight c3, sometimes with d3 first, was litigated, you know, at first without the computer. And without the computer, it's way more interesting because, you know, some people can claim that white is better or believe that white's better, and some people can claim that black is simply fine. The computer seems to think that basically it's equal, like a lot of positions. But of course, it's a really dynamic thing. And you'd, I would want to believe that white is better because it seems like we just have a nice version of the Sicilian here. But like I said, that's the other, the other battle that's been left behind. And this is some pretty highfalutin stuff that Fabi's going to do. And this next move, we're going to call it weird. And it's definitely a novelty. So knight a3. And uh, it's, it's a weird fright thing for a variety of reasons. Um, but let's just say before we talk about it that it's going to be certainly a good practical thing because Sevian will have studied the normalish position uh, that can arise here, for example, with moves like d4, which I feel like is the correct move for uh, white. Maybe it could go something like e4, f5, and e3. And then you get kind of a reversed French uh, with interesting play. Um, but this move, it's a very ambitious move, honestly, because if the knight doesn't become active, then we're really going to regret putting it on a3. And we're going to see here that the claim is that the knight is going to be useful on c2. And when you think about Sicilian players, you just never see, you very rarely see a knight going to that square. And on c2, the main thing it's looking for is d4. White wanting to bust that open. And you know, it's funny, you think about it, and, and you could say to yourself, well, okay, let's say you even achieve it. Why is it such a big thing? And um, I'm not, we'll see if it actually is a big thing, but the, I think the biggest thing for White to think about is that this knight is currently dominated by these two pawns, and it wants to get out of the way of the bishop anyway. So playing d4 has... Uh, will encourage that kind of development in the position, right? 
Okay, so here we go. I'm sure black could have done other things, but he plays bishop e6, knight c2, castles, and now I suppose the intention all along, which was e4. And um, I think if you don't, um, you know, if you haven't looked at the, the position with a computer and you have some opponent blitzing these things out, it's uh, definitely got to be uh, stressful. Because there's white, black does have a couple options, and it's as black, you know, I assume Sevian felt something like an emotion which was, uh, well, I can't be that bad, and he really can't be all that w worse here. But still, you have some questions like, do I play bishop g4? Do I play queen d3? And let's just say, if there's a danger in the position for black. It's not only that d4 is coming, but that this knight will just be useless. So that's something to think about for black. And uh, queen d3 was played. Let's pretend that that's got to be correct. Simply because if white plays rook e1, and he's going to have to kick the, the queen out before anything happens. Now, this next move could technically be called a mistake. It's kind of hard for me to call it a mistake just because it's so natural, rook a, d, a. But the problem, if we're going to say there's a problem, is that the um, white is going to get d4 after rook a, d, a. Now, uh, I assume a move that Fabi looked at beforehand I guess it's hard to imagine. It's so involved. <laughs> but I imagine you could get to this position beforehand. Or different variations of it is bishop g4. One thing, of course, that's a little funny about bishop g4 is that, of course, you're moving the piece twice. Um, and when you think, go back and think about bishop e6, what was it on move up? Uh, on move 9... Here we are playing it again. When on move nine, it wasn't clear, if we go back here, that you had to play bishop e6. You could have played castles. And arguably, maybe he's worried about knight c4, but I don't think that's a good, great move for white because the knight on b6 is wrong. So one of the things that's interesting about this game is you we get into it, it's kind of hard to exactly say like where Sevian made his mistake. And that's why Fabi's games can sometimes be so amazing. Because finding Black's mistake, sometimes even with the computer, isn't so easy, as was the game with Giaro. In any case, maybe Black could be accused of playing this natural move, thinking that Knight C4 was White's intention, when in fact Knight c4 is probably harmless. But okay, on the other hand, how could bishop b6 be that bad, right? Okay, knight c2, castles, e4, queen d3. And bishop g4 uh, after rook e1 is certainly a thought, but you have to contend with knight e3 and maybe, maybe rook e3 looks weird and maybe h3, but mainly I think knight e3 has got to be the main question when white would surrender his attempts to play d4, but he would be, if you take, which I assume you got to do something like that, you could also take with the queen and sacrifice the pawn, that you are going to lose the light squares. Interestingly enough, white will end up winning the light squares in this game too. So, hard to imagine that rook a d8 is a serious mistake, but it does lead to the following position. Bishop f1, queen d7, d4. Looks like you got to take. And there's funny, in this position, I'm watching the game, right? And uh, I say to myself, well, bishop g4 looks annoying. And, you know, I'm just, as a spectator, Jeff's fan watching this game. And it's a funny thing because Sevian does it. And then the weird thing is you realize after Fabi's move, Queen C2, you're like, well, wait a second. 
Bishop d4 looks like a good move, but maybe it in fact does absolutely nothing at all. Now that said, still pretty hard to find a plan for black. Um, maybe we need to start looking at moves, I don't know, like knight e5, something, something to get this pawn moving. And notice this guy, he really is a problem on b6. I think, by the way, there's a lot of Sicilian lines in uh, happening, well, I don't know, the last 15 years, where instead of playing knight b3, or in this case knight b6, uh, white is playing knight f3, just to be a little bit more active, even though it doesn't look, to old-fashioned guys like myself, that doesn't look natural. But you can see, especially in a position like this, the knight on b6 is contained. And notice also that this pawn's new pawn structure we got is also containing this poor knight on b6 here. So he's lost all his key squares. And he is really, he will be the victim in this game. All right, so bishop g4, I think you definitely have to say that's at least a minor inaccuracy because it's unclear that it does anything there. Snip, snip. And Savion just plays classically here. He's going to put the bishop on f8 and say, I'm solid. What do you want from me? Rook c1. And, you know, here's a, it's a really interesting uh, position for me anyways because, you know, it, sometimes I think players of my weak caliber see positions like this and they just feel like, oh, how am I ever really going to do anything against black? Right? He's solid on both sides. He's got his rooks in the center. He's about to play bishop f8. What am I really supposed to do? And this game, <laughs> this game is a really good instructive example of the kind of deeper powers and plans that lay beneath the surface. So I'm sure white could have done different things, but he plays b4. And you could say, you could criticize me and say, wait, Jesse, I thought you were telling me this b3 pawn was controlling the knight and yada yada. Well, that's true. And maybe it would have made me hesitant to play b4. Let's just note the quick tactic here, if bishop b4, queen b3. But more generally speaking, we need a little bit of space over there on the queen side now. And we're starting to play a global strategy where we're actually going to claim that the rooks on e8 and d8 not doing all that much and we are going to have play with this pawn and then these pawns coming forward and let me say something pretty obvious but i think it's important for this game we have a king side majority and that's going to mean that long term we have uh, more stuff in front of our opponent's king and more stuff in front of ours so that at least abstractly we should have uh, possibilities to put more pressure on his king than black can put on ours so black gets out of dodge b5 c5 knight f5 bishop f8 oh guys i'm sorry i've been reading the chat <laughs> uh, Oh, cool. Yeah. Percy is saying that he read my book three times. Uh, Lisa, that's really, that's really cool. Uh, I totally read it in chat. Uh, sometimes I forget to read the chat because I'm so consumed with the stream. Uh, but that's so great. Um, uh, Scott Post read it too. Very good. Yeah, I, I, you know, I worked really hard on that book. And I, you know, I, I'll, maybe I'll give a little background. My intention, you know, was really to for the book to be for people who might not actually be chess players to give them a, just a vague sense at least of what was going on for us chess people and why we did it kind of as a maybe a way a calling card for especially like the women in our lives who have no access to what we're doing and the book I think you know I'm very happy to say is mostly well received and yada yada but 
the where where my intention fell flat is it's mostly been chess players who've read it and when you when I've given it to people who are non chess players <laughs> I think they generally have not given it a chance so my initial intention with the book uh, didn't go quite as I had hoped all right um, chess with Chris glad to have you here so let's look in this position white plays h3 and we have a big decision for for uh, Sevian here. Now, my sense is he probably took on f5, thinking it was mostly the only move. And let's talk about why, first of all, that might be the intuition. If you do not take on f5, the grief is that the long-term pressure here will eventually become too much. At some point, this break, for example, is going to happen. So it's fully understandable that Sevion thought he should take. I turned on the computer here. It wanted to do like bishop h5 to keep the bishop. So it does introduce us, though, to the question is like, well, what is really wrong with this uh, position? And let me try to give, build a narrative for black as to why he's fine, first of all, right? Now, maybe he is in five, but let's like just do a narrative. We're going to say black has no weaknesses, and um, he's going to trade off at least some of the rooks. The bishop on b2 is blunted by the pawn on f6. And worst case scenario, black can imagine a situation, which happens in the game, that the queen side is liquidated, right? That we say, we treat, just imagine it, right? Our three pawns get lost for white's two pawns. It's a really interesting scenario because, and something about this game I still don't understand. Because my basic chess sense would be to say, well, if we liquidate the queen side, and as our compensation for all that we're able to bring the knight somewhere you know somewhere onto the king side the question would be like why should we lose and especially if we traded off queens it'd be like well why should we lose that position you know and um this in this game i'm still not sure of the answer but i'm what i'm most interested in is to try to think uh, try to see the game from fabi's eyes Okay, so here we go. Now, of course, from Fabi's eyes, it's just a nice position, and you don't have to tell yourself that you're winning in order, you know, to be happy with life. You're just like, well, I'm happy to get this one, right? Okay, rook takes, rook takes, and let's just say the obvious. It's hard for black to play a move like queen d2 because this rook is going to land on e8. Uh, for example, something like this. bishop a3 and there's no king g8 because of bishop c4 and if you like take this pawn then this guy's toast so that's the kind of drama that black is facing um, and one thing actually that shows that's important for us uh, later on too is the bishop pair along with that fat pawn on f5 are going to make the king uh, feel funny not only as a guy who might get mated but someone who later he might want to have an influence in the game and come into the game and that influence might be checked by a, you know literally checked by a bishop on the light squares okay so here we go uh Sevian goes for it with this variation this move that feels very natural to me you want to liberate your bishop on f8 and start some drama on the queen side so here we go a4 bishop b4 rook e4 all very strong now of course there's no queen f5 because of rook e8 so black says okay i'll get this guy and i'll give up that pawn but i'm going to get this one all right so let's pause for a second the, uh, if I was white, 
I'd be a little nervous that my advantage was maybe slipping. Just because I'm worried, like, well, if my if that queen side gets liquidated, why am I actually that much better? Right? That's an interesting question. Uh, Scott, they do look weak. Totally agree. The light squares. Uh, Dritman asks, is it because the pawn in f5 makes it tough for black to use this king in the endgame? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, now, for, 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 let's just be clear. White definitely has the advantage. The question really is simply, is he winning? And further, what kind of strategy should we be going for here? Um, we'll see what we mean in a second. Because I, th Well, let me show you exactly what I mean. So, bishop a3, knight b6, bishop b3, knight c8. All right, so the knight is really trying hard to rectify himself. And here's this interesting moment where, uh, by the way, I, was re I really tried hard to find if Fabi had done an interview in this game because I would love... He just said it was a great game, which it was, but I wanted to, you know, get his sense on how he approached the position here. Because, t to me, this seems like a critical moment where uh, I'd, r I'd rather, you know, let's, well, let's talk about White's advantages. Obviously, the bishop pair and the fact that this knight is terrible and the king is terrible. But like I said, the thing that I fear is the liquidation on the queen side. And what Fabi's going to set in motion in the next couple moves is just a uh, blatant liquidation of the queen side. I guess with the notion that even after that liquidation, we're still totally winning. Um, and, you know, maybe he got that wrong or whatever, but it's still an interesting thing that he went for. Now, let's just say that I think if he wants to kind of hold the tension, something like rook a4, and let's just let's just liquidate it for a second to see what it feels like. So let's just say snip. Maybe there's other things here, but let's just say snip, snip. Um, this position, I'm going to say, is probably lost. And... The reason is that the rook is really dominating the poor knight, and the king's not going to be able to come in. So a key question, I think, for black is going to be, can you get the knight in? Can you get the rook in? And so, to my mind, rook a4 is like a really annoying move for white, for black, and Mostly, I just want to prevent him from easily doing that a6 thing, right? So, all right. Five, let's look at what Fabi does. Fabi plays bishop d5, a6. Here it comes. And, of course, you can take on a6, but Fabi says, okay, let's just get it over with. And now a5. Now, imagine, like, if white gets the pawn on a5, or an a6, excuse me, then, you know, the argument is to say, well, then the rooks plus the bishops give very strong chances because we can use our king to control squares and hit. He, he, his king is going to be pushed out. Does he still, well, like, how would I assess it? Maybe clear advantage. What I'm interested in, though, is Fabi's thoughts. I kind of think that he would tell me I'm an idiot and be like, no, I'm totally winning here. You know, that's just the way it feels because he went in for this thing so uh, concretely. A5. Now, the pawn here is interesting. The pawn here on A5 is actually pretty annoying. Not so much because... Uh, white needs to worry about the thing queening. It's going to be basically very difficult for the thing to advance up the board. But rather because this bishop b4 can really mess with the cage that we want to keep this knight in. And we're going to see this right now with bishop c5. 
Um, this is a position I spent a lot of time on. Um, and I think for certain, uh, it seems like uh, the move that Sevian plays, knight a8, which looks, you know, just abysmal, that after that move, he is toast. I'm trying to come up with a good slang for, you know, this whenever someone puts a knight in the corner. I feel very comfortable with, say, when they put a knight on one of these squares, calling that a fianchetto knight, and I like that a lot. I don't know. It's not, <laughs> for whatever reason, the back of my mind wants to say the knight is ponged when it gets on uh, A8. Maybe that's just because I played a little ping pong recently. I have no idea. Anyways, the thing is ponged when it goes to knight A8. And let's spend a moment on knight C8. And the question is just going to be, like, is this actually winning or not? Now, um... I want to say I did turn on the beast when going through this, but the beast is sometimes not so helpful in these positions because, uh, it, well, I'll show you a couple of positions it thinks like white's clearly better and I'm just, n you know, not convinced. So, for example, one of my first notions was maybe, there, there's another question too, like, well, what was Savion afraid of? Because it feels like knight c8 is the move you'd play unless you were deeply afraid of something. So, for example, rook e6, I was thinking maybe he could be afraid of. But then again, this bishop b4 thing happens. And, uh, you know, imagine even if you lose that b pawn, there's a variety of ways this could get lost. But, um, I don't know, just for kicks, let's put in this. This is obviously totally drawn, at least for my book, right? That's just totally drawn. Uh, if we imagine if we had a bishop on the board and he had a knight and we still got the pawn, I still think that's, I would say that's drawn. And we're going to see another position, like I said, like that. So that's the problem with knight c8. And the most testing move looks to be rook c4. And the point. The very important point is this funny, it's a funny business move because the point is that we were trying to prevent bishop b4 because of takes and rook. However, it's really important to see that we can't move this bishop on c5 to attack the knight because we second we move that thing, uh, the, the knight can move, right? We move the corral to... You have to move the corralling piece to have the rook come in, and then the knight can move. So if we obviously, if we move it this way, you know, the knight comes this way, move it this way, the knight comes this way, or d6. And knight d6 in general is something we have to worry about. All right. I looked at a variety of moves here for black. Um, you know, he could do a very passive business with h6, but let's just say king g8, because it feels like the king needs to now come back. He probably wanted the knight on c7 instead of c1. Uh, true, and we'll, we'll look at that. I, it, unfortunately, the guy has no chance of getting to c7. Um, but let's look at this for a second. So the best variation I guess I could come up with white is not convincing. For example, king f1, knight d6, check to the miserable king, king e8, uh, rook here, king f8. And there's nothing concrete, surprisingly. And this move, bishop b4, is going to come pretty quickly. Now, maybe something he was afraid of that's kind of interesting is like king g8, um, rook c2 and you can play bishop h6 though maybe you're going to get uh, caught over there right but imagine this position g6 now the deal is that if bishop c8 rook c8 and this guy isn't hanging okay that's the first thing but a thing you definitely want to be afraid of is something like you could you could play fg first by the way from the following variation but rook d2 rook d2 
bishop c8. Uh, but I don't think this is winning. Um, let's say a4. And there's a kind of a... By the way, there's no there's no trick with rook c2 because of bishop e6. But the problem now for white and these bishops is that, you know, they can't form a blockade either on the dark or the light squares because they only have one piece. So this pawn is going to continue marching down the board. And it seems like it gives very good chances for black uh, to hold the game. I, my gut is that it's just an equal position. Yeah, so that's just a big problem <laughs> for me in figuring out this position. Uh, so let's look at it just one more time, and I swear to God I'll stop looking at it. King g8. Uh, let's say rook c2, g6, and we don't play rook takes d2, right? <sighs> yeah, let's say f takes h4. I really didn't know what else to do. King f7, bishop a6, knight e7. So the second the king is able to come to f7, uh, this knight e7 thing is possible. And then look, just bishop b4. He's being a real jerk. And if we imagine winning a pawn this way, well, I don't know. My sense is that that's a draw, that there's no way you're going to win this. Uh, yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> no, I don't think you're going to win this. <laughs> if it were a knight end game, you might have, I might be uh, inclined to say, yeah, you may, you may maybe have a very good chance because of the old saw about knight end games being the same as king and pawn endings but in this position i kind of doubt it whereas when i say with the computer the computer will just say something like well white's clearly better but that doesn't help me okay let's look at the game with this terrible ponged knight so knight a8 rook c4 x clan so there's no knight c7 ever because of bishop b6 bishop b4 bishop e3 and this is going to turn into a really evil business here. h6, h4. So black's just saying, I'm going to hide. Well, there's a problem with that hiding. And that is that Fabi is going to increase the pressure uh, on the king at some point with g5. So we're, we're talking to the king. We talk to him again. And now the, the knight really doesn't have any great squares and goes on this journey. G5, thank you very much. Knight C3, Bishop F3. And it's still an interesting question of like, well, do you think that uh, white is winning? And in fact, like, there's no simple way to see how black stops a mating attack, right? We're looking really at a, a mating attack of the two bishops. And let's just say Fabi's done several times in this game this standard domination procedure of the knight being this dis the rook being this distant from the knight and now i guess we're going to say it's lost right h takes h takes and then we've got a mating net goodbye mr knight you must move okay we'll take you bishop d5 beautiful bishop h3 is the threat rook h3 And I'm sure it was actually bishop a2 and bishop b3 was just a typo. So really beautiful game. Um, yeah, and let's, before I, actually, before I wrap this up, I want to say a uh, special announcement. Um, first of all, two things. Next week, at the same time, I'm going to be doing the submissions from chess.com of people's games. So if you want to partake in that there's a thread on chess.com if you just go to like forums and google my or not google it but type in my name into the forums probably the easiest way to find it and yeah the idea is if you uh, put in a game with any kind of annotations um, I will look at it and the intention is to say that uh, going over your own games is the best way to improve and then also 
and the other announcement I'm going to make is in about 20 minutes at 4 o'clock Central, 5 o'clock Eastern, I'm going to start doing Play the People. Now, this is a St. Louis Chess Club special where the GM in residence plays anybody who is out there and wants to play. And I believe we're going to be playing over chess.com. And uh, the... Um, but I'm not going to be using my normal handle, I think. I'm going to be using the St. Louis Chess Club handle. And the place to watch it, I believe, is the YouTube uh, account for the St. Louis Chess Club. So I'll be doing that from today at, at, in about 20 minutes. And also, I'm going to be doing it tomorrow, I think, at the same time. I, I'll check in on that and uh, give an update during the show. So let me wrap up this game and say really... Uh, high level chess where I think we can just as observing as a fan I want to say the following things it's a big deal that Fabi's able to get an interesting new position with some new ideas probably not winning or anything like that but simply getting a rich position out of the opening is its own special challenge these days um, so that's point one, and then point two, when you start asking yourself, well, what mistakes did Sevian make? None of them look really bad, except for the Pong Knight. And that's old, you know, it's funny, when I analyze my own games and other people's, I like to say that you shouldn't beat yourself up over every single mistake that you make, right? You're going to make some mistakes, and it's just some crimes <laughs> deserve whipping more than others. And so the Ponged Knight really deserves some kind of whipping. And clearly Black had some fears about going to C8 because Knight A8 looks wrong. But the other mistakes, let's even put them in scare quotes, uh, aren't e so easy to see, right? Like maybe Bishop E6 is an inaccuracy. Probably Rook A D8 is an inaccuracy. But when you just look at those moves, they feel so natural that it's hard to imagine that they're that wrong. So that's the level of chess we're at with Fabi. I think um, I'm going to try to cover several of his games that he plays before we go to the World Championship knockout. Uh, I think he, he and Ding are roughly equal for winning that event. Um, but of course, anything can happen in that event. They're not assured to win it. But I think with a longer format, you know, their skills are going to prevail in the long run. But when you look at it just statistically, right, both of those guys are over 2,800, and their competition is going to be around 2,850, 2,860 on the average. So 40 rating points, right? Will it really show in the long run in a tournament of that duration? That'll be the question. All right, I hope you guys can join me uh, in a little bit. We're going to do the streaming event. Till then, bye-bye.